Good evening. Welcome to the Adler Planetarium. Uh, my name is Andrew Johnson. I'm the Vice President here at the Adler for Astronomy and Collections. I'm really happy to welcome you here to the Adler tonight uh, for our really fascinating program. We're really looking forward to learning more about how we map the world. Uh, our program tonight is a collaboration of, uh, of the Friends of the Webster Institute, one of our membership societies here, and the Chicago Map Society. We're, we'd like to give a special warm welcome to our friends the, at the Map Society, uh, many of whom are, are in the audience here. Uh, there's lots of other map events coming up, as the map collectors in the audience know. Um, also, next year at about this time, we're going to be doing uh, another one of these, of these uh, collaborative events. Uh, we're aiming to have it actually at the Newbury Library, and our curator uh, here at the Adler, uh, Pedro Raposo, uh, will be uh, speaking about lunar mapping, uh, so stay tuned to your calendars uh, for that. It's a long way off, I know. But, uh, but tonight, uh, we're, we're, what we wanted to do is uh, uh, present a, a program not just about uh, Mercator, the map projection, but we also thought it was an interesting way of getting at how we actually map uh, the world. Uh, that's, it's something that probably the majority of the people in this room understand, but a lot of people uh, don't even recognize map projections that they see when they look at uh, internet map servers and so forth. So this is a going back in time and telling some of that history. Our speakers tonight, we actually have two speakers who will be going uh, back and forth. They tell me that they'll be alternating about 15 minutes at a time, so you'll be seeing these two gentlemen. Um, we've got Joaquim Caspar, uh, who's uh, uh, he's a postdoc researcher at, uh, at the University of Lisbon. Um, and he uh, researches uh, issues, the history of uh, nautical cartography and navigation. And recently, he's uh, two published works with his co-author, who you'll also be hearing from, um, about uh, Mercator's uh, 1569 uh, world map. Um, and he was recently awarded a, a competitive grant from the European Research Council to continue uh, his research in the study of early nautical charts. Enrique Letao, uh, who's uh, seated... Uh, uh, the, the two gentlemen right here. Uh, he's a senior researcher at the same university uh, and also head of the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Lisbon. Uh, he received his PhD in theoretical physics but then took a turn. Is that a fair to say? Or, or, or degraded. No, no. Well, uh, or, no, no, this is a history focused crowd. So it took a turn for the better. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and focused his career actually on, on the history of science. Um, and he focuses mostly on the early modern uh, uh, period in Europe, uh, specifically mathematical sciences. Um, and in fact, he led the, the publication of the complete works uh, of, of uh, Pedro Nunez, the, the Portuguese uh, 16th century mathematician. Did I get that right? Yep. Excellent. Good. Um, and he was awarded the 2014 uh, Pessoa Prize, uh, which, uh, which was uh, given every year to recognize a leading figure in the scientific, artistic, and literary uh, culture of uh, Portugal. So please uh, join me in uh, giving. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Enrique Letao and Joaquim Caspar. Okay. Good evening to everybody. So thank you very much for coming. We are Joaquim and I. We are really honored and uh, a little bit frightened with the with the prospect. But first of all, I would like to say one or two words of thanks for, to the Adler Planetarium and you know, especially to Pedro Raposo and also to Andrew for the invitation to be here. It is truly an honor for us and also an opportunity to tell a little bit about our work. The, the fame of the Adler Planetarium you know, crosses the Atlantic, so we knew already a lot about the, the collections, especially you know, as an historian of science, we, we knew a lot about the collection. But I have to say that seeing them in in uh, in direct, you know, in front of them, it's absolutely amazing. The astrolabe collection, the telescope collection, the sundial collection. I mean, this was absolutely. I'm absolutely astonished. And you are so lucky that you. I don't. I don't know if you really realize how lucky you are with the. Uh, astonishing collections of instruments that you have here. So congratulations for this because it's always a lot of hard work to keep this going. I'm also very happy to that this is a joint meeting of the friends of the Webster, uh, uh, Webster Institute and the Chicago Map Society. Why? Because our topic will clearly overlap with your two interests. We will be talking about maps, but also how maps were shaped by instruments, or to put it in another way, the practices associated with instruments. So there's, there's a, a bit of the two things, instruments and maps to the, the two audiences. And our topic is very broad, so we, we put a little bit of different materials, 
but so some of the things will be very well known to most of you, I would say, or at least to some of you, but there is very recent material here in our topic, and there is even material that, was not, that has not been published yet. So one of the things that we really wanted to do to you is to present you in the first, in the, for the first time results of our joint research which, have, which are not published yet, and we find them truly exciting. So let us hope that you feel the same too. So as Andrew said, we will be you know, speaking at a time. This will be a mano a mano thing. But uh, we will use a script, so we have a text, and we've, we timed this for 55, 60 minutes. And we hope to don't, you know, slide, but we'll try to keep it. But we'll use a text, but when an image is, but at the end there will be opportunity for us to discuss a little bit, um, you know, answer questions, etc. Okay, so let's go. Our presentation is about maps. Now, maps in general is an enormous topic. We will be speaking only about European maps in the early modern period. Even more specifically, we will be interested only in nautical charts. So we're short reducing the field. Actually, we will be speaking about the relation between long distance oceanic voyages and the development of the whole image of the Earth. So this is a brief summary of our presentation today. First of all, we need to understand the great transformation that took place when European sailors, using techniques and the tradition that had developed along the centuries for Mediterranean navigation, started navigating in the ocean. It was a tremendous change in scale. We will then look at the new problems this entailed and what were the new solutions devised to tackle these problems. Here we will look in some detail at a very important topic, the intimate connection between navigation techniques and cartographic representations. The issue of magnetic declination and the idea of drawing magnetic maps of the Earth, an important but very poorly known topic, will be our third topic. And finally, we will look into the famous Mercator projection, not only to explain how it was constructed, but also to show that in this famous map there is quite more than meets the eye. So, let us begin. Okay. So, for many centuries, for Europeans, navigation meant, above all, navigation in the Mediterranean Sea and along the coast of Europe. The Mediterranean was the laboratory where Europeans learned to sail. Some of the most epoch-making voyages of ancient times were of this kind. For example, here are the voyages of Ulysses in his adventurous path from Troy to Ithaca. As all voyages in the Mediterranean, these were short-range, port-to-port passages, usually along the coast. Open sea stretches were of the order of hundreds of kilometers, and the time at sea was of the order of days. This is the typical scale of Mediterranean voyages, where the coast is never very far away. Navigational techniques at that time were adapted to this type of sea travels. When magnetic compasses appeared in Europe sometime in the late 12th century, Mediterranean navigation proceeded using what is called dead reckoning. For determining the ship's position at sea, pilots would steer along a course directed by the magnetic needle and then estimate the distance traveled. Apparently, this was a rather crude way to determine position, but enough for coastal and Mediterranean navigation. Medieval nautical maps, the so-called portulan charts, were constructed using this type of navigational information, that is, directions measured with the magnetic compass and distances estimated by the pilots. We will be speaking more about this because one of the most important points that we want to stress is that an understanding of the navigational techniques is crucial to the understanding of these old maps. 
Okay, but suddenly, and by this we mean historically suddenly, that is in the matter of a few decades, a surprising phenomenon occurred. Sailors from Iberia started sailing in long distance in the open ocean without land in sight. This was a completely novel situation for European seamanship, which demanded a set of new solutions, most especially navigation, cartography, and shipbuilding. Here is the most epic of these voyages, the famous India Run, the sea route that Portuguese navigators initiated at the end of the 15th century. As it can be immediately seen, this is wholly different from coastal port-to-port -port sailing. In this voyage, two hemispheres were traversed and several oceans were crossed. What needs to be noted most of all is the overwhelming scale, completely different from that of prior centuries. Uh, what? Sea stretches away from any site of land were typically thousands of miles long and lasted for many weeks or months. A point that also needs to be noted is that this was truly a voyage of a planetary scale. By this, I mean something very precise. I have this. Let me see if I can use the... Oh, here it is. By this, I mean the following. The, the departure from Lisbon, you know, there, the departure, was determined by the time of the monsoon in the Indian Ocean. Ships had to depart from Lisbon in March or April so that they could arrive to the Indian Ocean in July or August at the latest in order to take profit of the monsoon that would carry them to India. So the departure was determined by the geophysical conditions in the other side of the world. This is what is meant by the first route with planetary scale. This is absolutely different from any experience that Europeans had ever had. Some very well-known voyages of this period were of this type. Well, here is the voyage of Columbus. The celebrated first voyage of Christopher Columbus to the West Indies when the Atlantic Ocean was first crossed. Vasco da Gama's voyage, perhaps you heard the name, of course, voyage to India. So this is an old map explaining, you see this voyage here, to India. At the very end of the 15th century was the first time that the India run was accomplished, still in a somewhat exploratory manner, as Gama was very unfamiliar with the sailing conditions in the Indian Ocean. Note the very long route in the South Atlantic in the open ocean for many, many weeks to take advantage of wind circulation. And finally, here is Magellan's voyage, represented in a map of mid-16th century. It is a completely remarkable voyage. Note the immense distances traversed in open ocean, with no sight of land. One cannot but amaze at the fact that Magellan the first European to reach the Pacific Ocean with a fleet did the unthinkable. He crossed the greatest ocean of the earth in one go. How did he do it? I mean, he arrived here for the first time with, with ships and then he just said, let's do it in one go. The whole Pacific. How did he do it? Was it sheer courage and recklessness or was there more to it? 16th century maps of the New World were made as a consequence of these voyages. And the point we want to convey is that if there is any hope of truly understanding the nature of those maps, we really need to know something about the ways used to navigate at sea. So new problems demanded new solutions. Let us look at this into some more detail. Okay. Thank you, Rick. It's better. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. In 1434, 
after several forestated attempts which involved various pilots at the surface of Prince Henry, the navigator, Prince Henry of Portugal, Gilianes finally succeeded in routing Cape Bujador, the meeting headland of the African western coast facing the Canary Islands. Many dangers and obstacles were associated at that time with these coastal waters, the shoals emerging at the surface, the strong currents preventing the ships to come back home, the arid lands where no life form could survive, and even the marine monsters that, in the imagination of the pilots, populated the Denebra Sea. However, most of those fears were of psychological nature, and it became eventually apparent to the sailors that doubling Cape Bujador did not involve extraordinary difficulties. On the contrary, the southwest progression of the ships was facilitated by the trade winds blowing from the northeast and by the Canary Current flowing parallel to the African coast. The most difficult problem they had to face was to sail back against these same elements. We'll see how the, this difficulty was mitigated. At the time Cape Bujador was rounded, the ships used in the, in the exploratory voyages could hardly progress against the wind, which often, often made the return trips long and arduous. The introduction of the caravel equipped with Latin sails and capably of laughing more effectively. Do you know what laughing is? Well, it's to progress against the wind. We presented a major improvement. Also, a better knowledge of the wind and current climate in the region made, made the pilots eventually realize that a more efficient way of bringing the vessel home was. First, to turn away from the coast in order to avoid, to avoid the current and the northerly winds, and then to make a long westward detour through the Sargasso Sea up to the latitude of the Azores before heading to the coast of Portugal. This oceanic route, introduced about 1450, became known as the turn of the open sea, in Portuguese, a volta do mar largo, and contributed much to the success of the exploratory and commercial voyages along the African coast. However, a problem of a different nature needed still to be solved before the solution could be adopted safely and effectively. During the 15th century, navigation in European waters was usually made near the coasts, using the information about courses and distances that was registered in the pilot's rudders. Sometimes it was necessary to sail away from the coast to reach a distant island or to cross a larger body of water. But these open water tracks seldom took more than a few days. In those situations, the position of the ship was determined on the basis of the course, the course steered, measured by the marine compass, and the distance sailed along the track, estimated by the pilot. The position determined that way was known by the Iberian pilots of the time as the point of fantasy, a colorful designation that expressed the uncertainty associated with the estimation process. Although considerable errors could be made with these methods, they seldom represented a serious problem because the position could be easily corrected as soon as the coast was again in sight. That was, of course, not the case when the ships stayed in the deep ocean for several days or weeks, as when returning from the coast of Africa along the turn of the open sea. As time elapsed, the accuracy of the estimated positions steadily degraded to the point of becoming almost useless. To face this new problem, a new navigational method had to be found. What happened to this? <laughs> okay. Hmm? It's okay. And, uh, 
the slide. Okay. Thank you, Eric. The solution was the introduction of astronomical navigation during the second half of the 15th century, made possible by the simplification of the instruments of observation used by astronomers on land, the quadrant and the astrolabe and the development of very simple procedures that could be used by the uninstructed pilots. For example, the so-called Regiment of the North, a set of instructions for determining latitude by observing the height of the pole star above the horizon. When the systematic exploration of the African coast began, the nautical charts used by the pilots in the European waters were the same Portland charts of the Mediterranean and Western Europe, which were constructed using the compass courses and the distances between the ports estimated by the pilots. That is, for example, the case of this Portland chart made by the Portuguese cartographer Jorge de Guiar in 1492. or this chart of, of about 1471 drawn by an anonymous cartographer at the time the Portuguese were exploring the Gulf of Guinea. Notice how the chart is no longer centered at the Mediterranean, which is not even represented, but at the western coast of Africa. And also, this chart of Pedro Reynel of the end of the 15th century where part of the African coast was drawn inland. Here. Just because the old model, the old pattern from which it was partly copied, did not consider the newly discovered lands. With the introduction of navigational astronomy, the process of finding the ship's position of sea changed dramatically. The part of fantasy gave place to, so, to the so-called set point methods, where the latitude determined on board became the prevailing element of navigational information. That is, the position of the ship was determined on the chart at the interception between the line representing the course steered, the oblique line here, here's one, and the parallel representing the observed latitude, the specked horizontal line. The superlative importance of this technical development cannot be overemphasized, as the accuracy and reliability of the new navigational methods permitted to establish regular oceanic routes from Europe to India and to the Far East for the centuries to come. However, the old Portland-type chart that we have just seen was not compatible with the new navigational methods. And to, to represent the coastlines according to the latitudes of the places, a new cartographic model had to be created. The earliest chart where the astronomical observed latitudes were incorporated is the Cantino nautical planisphere, drawn by an anonymous Portuguese cartographer in 1502 and brought to Italy in the same year by an emissary of the Duque Ferrara, Alberto Cantino. This is a most precious historical monument of our cartographic heritage, depicting the world as it became known to the European nations, nations after the great discoveries of the 15th century, to Africa, Newfoundland, Central America, Brazil, and India. Notice how these regions are already represented in their approximate geographical locations and how detailed some of them are. With the Cantino Planisphere, a new cartographic standard was established, promptly adopted by many other world maps of the beginning of the 16th century. Like the Caverio Planisphere of circa 1504, 
almost entirely copied from the continue, and the two printed world maps by Martin Waldseemuller now kept in the Library of the Congress, based on the Caverio, the one of 1507, where the name America appears for the first time, and also the Carta Marina of 1516. The point I would like to address now regarding these early modern charts is the following. How accurate are them? Very often, the historians have tried to give an answer to this question by comparing the coastlines depicted in old charts with those of modern representations. If we apply this procedure to the outline of Africa in the continued planisphere, on the right, by using a satellite image of the world as a model, on the left, the result is astonishing. Notice how in the old chart, the contour of the continent appears displaced and stretched in the east-west direction, making the isthmus of Suez up there. To look enormous. How can we explain this gross distortion, which was replicated in all cartography of the 16th century and beyond, including Waldse Muller Carta Marina? Here. Various explanations were given by the historians. Most have considered that this was an expected result of the poor surveying techniques of the time. Others suggested that the longitudinal that the longitudinal extent of the continent was copied from the old maps derived from Ptolemy's geography. However, both of these explanations are wrong, and we, and we will see next how important it is to correctly interpret the geometry of the old charts in order to fully understand their historical significance. In order to place ourselves firmly within the navigational, uh, the navigational and cartographical reality of the time, let us consider the following experiment. Suppose that we take part in an exploration voyage in the beginning of the 16th century with the purpose of representing the coast of, of Africa on a chart. Departing from Lisbon, the idea is to sail around the African continent up to Cape Guardafui. Cape Guardafui is here, keeping the track as close to the coast as possible. All we have available as navigational instruments is a magnetic compass to steer the ship, the ship and an astrolabe to determine latitude on board. We are requested to keep a navigational record containing the dates, the places, the courses steered, and the latitudes determined along the route, as in this table. For the sake of simplicity, let us assume that we are all expert pilots and that we will arrive safe and sound at Cape Guardafui. <laughs> After the trip is completed, the next step will consist in representing graphically the ship's track on a, on a modern chart. For that purpose, we are supposed to use a chart on the Mercator projection, like this one, where the courses measured at the spherical surface of the Earth are correctly represented as straight segments on the plane. The idea is to reconstruct the route using the set point method. Remember the set point method? Some of you, yes. On the basis of the courses steered and the latitudes observed along the voyage. The first track registered in the log is the one connected Lisbon to the island of Madeira. The course is approximately southwest and the latitude of Madeira is 32 degrees north. Well, the result is totally unexpected and seems to con contradict our direct experience as we are absolutely sure that the coastline was in sight most of the time and that Cape Guardafui was indeed reached at the end of the voyage. Something went very wrong. <laughs> but what? 
I will propose two explanations. First, that Africa has moved <laughs> to the West in the last 500 years, owing to the dynamics of the Earth's crust, the so-called plate tectonics. This is serious. <laughs> and second, that our magnetic compass was faulty, making the courses registered in our log to be wrong. Let us try a little poll here. <laughs> Those we agree with the first explanation, please raise your hand. <laughs> well, <laughs> we have one. <laughs> now, who agrees with the second? Well, we have a few more. <laughs> and the correct answer is the second, of course. Although, we cannot really blame the compass. Let me explain why. Most of the people here know that the direction indicated by a magnetic compass, the so-called magnetic north, is not usually the direction of the geographical north. To the angle between the direction of the magnetic north and the true north, the angle delta in the figure, this one, we call magnetic declination. For example, the magnetic declination illustrated in the figure is about 25 degrees west, because the compass needles point to a direction which is 25 degrees to the west of the true north. Now, let us come back to our experiment. Knowing that it took place in the 16th century and that we have used an ordinary magnetic compass to measure the courses, it is expected that those directions were all affected by magnetic declination. If the, same twist, if the same trip were made using a modern gyro, comp gyro compass not affected by magnetic declination, the track registered in our log would look like this one. However, in the beginning of the 16th century, magnetic declination was east in the ocean, o ocean in the Atlantic Ocean and west in the Indian Ocean. This caused all compass courses in the Atlantic to have negative errors, making the corresponding tracks to be rotating counterclockwise. And all magnetic courses in the Indian Ocean to have positive errors, making the corresponding tracks to be rotated clockwise. Is this clear? OK. Thus, can we really conclude that the compass was faulty? Not really, because it behaved exactly how it was supposed to behave. Although the pilots of the 16th century were perfectly aware of the phenomenon of magnetic declination, no corrections were made to the courses measured with the compass. Most importantly, and this is a critical point to understand the nautical cartography of the time, no corrections were made. I say again, no corrections were made to the directions used to construct the charts. Thus, it won't come as a surprise that our track along the African continent, which was determined with a magnetic compass, almost exactly matches the coastline in the continual planisphere. After this experiment, it seems now clear that the the usual criteria of cartographic accuracy based on the latitudes and longitudes of the places cannot be applied to old nautical charts, which were based on magnetic directions and latitudes, and whose explicit, explicit purpose, purpose was to support marine navigation. That was the mistake of the historians of the past. To conclude this part of the presentation, the important point I want to make is that nautical charts of all times can only be fully understood in the context of the navigational methods they are supposed to support. In that sense, a nautical chart should be considered not as a faithful depiction of the land masses of the world, that is the purpose of a geographical map, but as a diagram to support navigation. And I'll and now I give the word to Enric. Thank you. 
Okay, it's more fun changing speakers, isn't it? And then when you're fed up, one, then the other shows up. Okay. So as we just saw, one cannot truly understand the geometry of old nautical charts without considering the effect of magnetic declination on the magnetic compasses. This is a very important topic, but the fact that courses measured with a compass were not corrected, that's what Joachim just explained, that they were not corrected by the pilots and cartographers shouldn't fool us into thinking that they were not aware of the phenomenon. As a matter of fact, when sailors started navigating in long distance, they immediately realized that the value of magnetic declination varied from place to place. Since the late 15th century, Portuguese sailors started to systematically collect values of the declination along the paths they were traversing. At a certain point, the idea that longitude could be derived from the value of magnetic declination measured at sea became very popular. However, this notion was denied by you know, a famous uh, sailor and nobleman and navigator, João de Castro. So based on, a caref on careful observations of magnetic declination in a voyage that he made to India, he demonstrated that there was no direct connection between magnetic declination and longitude, which of course we know that there isn't. Yet, values of the local magnetic declination continued to be collected in oceanic voyages, systematically collected. So pilots, when they started their you know, sailing, you know, when they started from Lisbon, they were explicitly instructed that they had to measure each day the value of magnetic declination. Mariners soon realized that this local value was a value of declination, was a valuable piece of navigational information that could help in ascertaining the ship's position and in defining the right moment for important changes of course. And when reading carefully the rudders and you know the, the, the logs, the ship's logs, we do find that they say, you go this in this direction, and when the magnetic declination is such as such, then you will know that you will have to turn the ship, you know? So this type of information, okay. By mid-16th century, however, and now there's more to it, huh, the issue of magnetic declination seems to have taken another direction, a fascinating one. And this is all pretty new, so we will, you will be the first to hear about it. The most telling document of what was the new idea is this remarkable nautical chart, again by a Portuguese cartographer of the name Teixeira, Luís Teixeira, of around 1585, so on your left side. So it is not, it is not in very good condition, but it's a, uh, uh, a nautical chart, a chart. The chart depicts an area of the Southeast Pacific. Let me try to show you. Some coastal lines are surely imaginary, or at least highly speculative, as was common in a region that was still poorly known, but there are others that correspond to known places. So this is you know, the region of New Guinea, and uh, I don't see it very well, but this is Japan, this is Japan, and this is the coast of China, etc. So this, this is the area. What is remarkable about this map is that it is the first known nautical chart, actually the first known map, to represent lines of equal magnetic declination. These are called isogonic lines. And these are these lines here, you see? The map has some awkward lines here, okay? And you see, there's a shape. And these are line, isogonic lines, so along each of, the, of the, those lines, the, the value of magnetic declination is constant. Mm -hmm. The first time that uh, we see a map with, with, with such a feature. Well, it, this is very important for many reasons. One of the reasons is just priority. If it is generally asserted that the first map representing isogonic lines was this printed map here, 
you know, isogonic lines over there, by uh, Edmund Halley in 1702. 1702, yes. But we, now we see it was not. It was 150 years before. Okay. As it happens, so there is a much longer story in what relates to the attempt to measure what we called magnetic field. Of course, it did not call field, but the distribution of magnetism around the Earth. And this story, you know, goes all along to you know at least the 16th century and long distance oceanic navigation. What we have nowadays, it is simply a fragment of a much larger chart. Actually, it is highly likely that the original map of Teixeira was a complete planisphere. And this is, you know, it's very easy to argue. So we, this is a fragment that we have. But just by looking more carefully, it, it is obvious that this was a complete planisphere. That is, around 1585, at the latest, Portuguese cartographers were already trying to draw magnetic line, magnetic maps of the whole Earth. But with what purpose? We do not have now the time to go into complete detail, but what we can say is that we have very strong reasons to believe that by mid-16th century, Portuguese cartographers were trying to use the value of local magnetic declination not only simply as an aid to navigation, as before, but actually as a means of determining the ship's position at sea. The idea was the following. If reasonably accurate maps of, of isogonics, so of these lines, were made, it could be possible, at least in principle, to use them together with measurements of latitude to determine position at sea. So if you know that you are in a region where the magnetic declination is one degree to the east, so it corresponds to being, in, for example, in this line here, and then if you measure latitude and you'll know that we'll be here, then you will know your position. So this was the idea. So maps for the old earth, magnetic maps for the old earth, were being made you know, by 1555 at the latest. So again, this remarkable cartographic, cartographic item, a magnetic map of the whole Earth, appeared in the context of navigation. A question that immediately arises is the following. How good is this representation? Are these isogonic lines accurate? Well, this is not so easy to answer because of the following. The magnetic field of the Earth has a very complex behavior that changes not only in space but also over time. This we know today, of course. So luckily, nowadays, there are models that reproduce with reasonable accuracy the values of magnetic declination in historical times and thus allowing us to assess the accuracy of Luis Teixeira. So let us look at this. And this is what you find here is the, you know, the map of Teixeira redrawn. And these are two modern, two modern models for the magnetic field of the Earth. And what one sees is absolutely remarkable. Although the precise numerical values here are, you know, are in some error, of course, they're not very accurate, the overall shape is absolutely correct. So, I mean, you know, more technically, you would say the topology of the, of the magnetic field here is completely captured in the 16th century, which, as you see, it's this, like this way, or in another model, it goes like this. And the, the direction of the variation to one, from one side to the other, this is also correct. So this is absolutely striking. So the argument is remarkable, not, not in its actual values, of course, but in the overall shape of the magnetic field. So obviously, some measurements were made to draw the Teixeira map. We presently suspect that this chart was drawn with a combination of some theoretical model, a rough, a very, very rough model of how the magnetic field would behave in the Earth, very rough, of course, and some measurements, some numerical measurements. What can we make of all this? Well, there are many aspects that would be worth commenting, but let me just focus on one. 
what the Teixeira map clearly, in fact, visually depicts is the concept that magnetic properties are extended throughout the Earth and vary along the Earth. That is, to put it another way, what this remarkable chart shows is that such a sophisticated theoretical notion as this, that magnetism is a property related to the Earth in toto and distributed along the Earth, that this concept was born from the daily practice of sailors and life on board. Here we have a striking example that recalls us to the fact that in order to understand many developments in science, one needs to look carefully at artisanal activities of mere technicians, such as pilots and sailors. Okay, let me now completely change topic, not change speaker, but change topic. Okay? Of course, so I insisted on the importance, and Joachim also comment on the importance of understanding what was going on on board, you know, made by sailors, by mariners, by people of low levels of instructions. But of course, artisans and pilots are not the whole story. Top level mathematicians and very learned cartographers also played an important part. Oceanic navigation also led to surprising mathematical developments and these in turn gave rise to very important cartographic improvements. Let us first of all, and we want to give you a flavor uh, of this uh, to you and, and then look at to the Mercator projection. Let us first of all consider a crucial problem in navigation at sea. Suppose we are on a ship in the ocean, actually to make things more easy, suppose it's, it's all an ocean, so it's water all over the earth, and that we decide to sail around the earth keeping always the same course or direction, always the same direction, as indicated by a modern compass. What will happen? Well, one possibility, of course, is that since we are moving along the, always along the same direction, we will make a complete turn of the Earth and return to the point of departure. This is called a great circle, this figure here, and it is the equivalent of a straight line in the plane. Okay, this is one possibility, but perhaps there's something tricky going on here, right? Perhaps there is something more subtle going on, and while maintaining the same direction, we move along a different path. What do you think will happen to a, a ship in such conditions? If you, in, in the surface, well, let, let's, you know, Joaquin made a pole, I want to make a pole too. So, if you, if you sail along the same direction always, what do you think will happen? Will you make a complete turn and return to the point of departure? Who thinks so? Sorry? Okay, yep. So I have it here. <laughs> he did the slide, so he knew the way. Okay, so, or, uh, well, the ship will sail along some other track and will not come back to the point of departure. And I think, of course, this is a very learned audience, and of course you know that two is the correct option. But let's look a little bit more carefully into this because this is very important to understand, very important to cartography and to understand some topic. It is not very, very technical, so we'll need to look at some graphs, but not, not specific. Why is this so? Well, what does it mean, really, to keep the same direction or course, the technical term, at sea? What does it mean, the same direction? Direction or course is the angle with the north, that is with the local meridian. If one is to sail always with the same course, one has to cross all meridians with the same angle. But take a look at what happens along a great circle. Because the meridians are converging to the pole, you know, because meridians converge, the angles along the great circle, the angles between the, the great circle and the meridians 
are not the same. So you see, at this point, we make this angle here, the red thing, this angle, but then we, we, we keep on in, in this direction, the great circle, but now the angle is bigger. And there, the angle is even bigger. So if you know, maintaining the same direction means maintaining the same, crossing the meridians also with, with the same angle, this is not doing that, okay? So, and what, what, what happens in reality, and I will go briefly into this, very briefly, is that if you cut the meridians always with the same angle, you will make a very awkward curve called a rumb line, or for those of you who know, know about navigation, a loxodrome, awkward name, okay? But this line, it, it's a spiral, you know, around the Earth, and if you look carefully, this is looking through the pole, it has to be so in order that the angles with the meridian are always the same, okay? And if this is at the surface of the Earth, it will be like this. So the rumb line, this very strange line, is the line that you will make on a ship if you maintain always the same course, the same direction. So rumb line is an absolutely fundamental concept in navigation, and a lot of work was expanded in the 16th century to make a full mathematical theory of these lines. And it was made within the limits of 16th century mathematical techniques, of course. The way to study mathematical, mathematical these lines is by calculating what is called a table of rumbs. What is a table of rumbs? It's no big deal. It's just a table where you put the latitude and the longitude for the points along one of those lines. So here it is. I'm, I, you know, look, the line is there, and I'm, and I'm doing this table. This is called a table of rums. You don't need to, to follow all technical details, but it, for the rest of the story, it will be important to understand that there is this notion of a table of rums. Interestingly, we know that this discussion and this poll that I made and all the, 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 the confusion about these two concepts, the, the Great Circle and the Rebel of Line, this was a discussion in the 16th century. Okay? And then there was this man, this Nunes, who clarified in here that these were two different concepts in this, in this book. Nunes calculated tables of rums, the mathematical description of this thing, this curve. Actually, by mid-16th century, some other mathematicians and cosmographers in Europe had tackled the same problem also and calculated also tables of rums. For example, this is John Dee, you know, famous mathematician and cosmographer of Queen Elizabeth I in England. And John Dee, this is a table of rums calculated by John Dee around 1557 or something around this table. So we are now, and okay, and just to end this part, and in 1566, so this Nunes published a book explaining, so a printed book, how to calculate these tables with a mathematical theory of these tables of rumps and how to calculate this. Okay, with these elements, we are now in condition to look into a very interesting problem and a question, an enigma, and its solution in the history of cartography. And since it's very interesting, I leave it to Joaquim. Thank you, Eric. Okay, it's all right. <laughs> I go a little faster. Well, that is, how could a nautical chart be constructed in such a way as to depict these strange spherical spirals as straight segments, making the correct angle, the same angle with the meridians. If that were possible, the planning and execution of navigation would be enormously facilitated because the ship's tracks could be easily measured and traced on the chart using simple instruments, rollers, protectors, and dividers. A solution for the problem was found by the cosmographer Gerard Mercator in 1569 with the construction of his world map Nova et Octa Orbis Terra Descriptio at Unzo Navigantio Emendate Accomodata, that is, new and improved descriptions of the Earth properly adjusted for the use in navigation. In this map, 
Meridians and parallels form a regular mesh of rectangles where the spacing between parallels increases with latitude in such a way that rumb lines are represented by straight segments making through angles with the meridians. The same spiral, the same strange lines are these lines here. Okay. Mercata did not explain how we calculated this projection, and the issue had remained open for more than 100 years, during which numerous hypotheses were proposed by the historians. We know that Mercator's method must have been of empirical nature, since the mathematical concepts and tools necessary to provide a formal solution had not been developed yet. We also know that he was fully aware of the geometrical properties of his novel projection. But how exactly did he solve the problem? That is, how did, did he calculate the spacing between the parallels? Quite recently, in two articles published in the prestigious journal Imago Mundi, we have Henry and I finally solved the mystery. Our approach was thorough and systematic. Not only we have considered the historical context that shaped Mercator's achievement, including Pedro Nunes' finding about, about the rumb line, but also we have assessed carefully the geometry of Mercator's graticule as it appears, appears in his world map. That was a difficult task owing to the fact that the printed sheets of the map are physically distorted owing to aging and that those distortions vary from sheet to sheet and from copy to copy of the map. Not considering this effect was a fatal flaw of the historians of the past because the measurements made on the printed map were contaminated by a factor that had nothing to do with Mercator's method. Finally, we were able to reverse the effect of physical distortion and retrieve the original val values calculated by Mercator to trace the parallels on the map. The process has some complexity and will not be explained here. <laughs> OK, maybe later if you are interested. <laughs> okay. The important thing now is that by comparing those values with the theoretical ones of the Mercator's projection, which can be in the present day calculated by a complex formula, a curve was determined representing the errors in the position of the parallels associated with the unknown method used by Mercator, to which we have called the error signature of the graticule. Next step was to compare this curve with the error with the corresponding ones associated with the various methods proposed in the literature. To this set of methods, we have added our own proposal based on the use of a table of rumps. The result was clear. None of the methods suggested by the historians in the past reproduced the error signature of the map. That was expected given the fact that most of them were purely conjectural and none has taken into, into proper account the physical distortions of the paper. On square paper, draw a horizontal line representing the equator and mark this line with the linear scale of latitudes. Draw a series of straight and equally spaced meridians perpendicular to the equator. These vertical lines. Choose one of the traditional rams, for example, the fourth ram, 45 degrees measured from the north, and represent it as a straight segment starting from the bottom left corner of the graticule and making an angle of, of course, 25 degrees with the meridians. All we have to do now is to add the parallels to the projection in such a way that all points of the rumble line on the sphere will be on this green line. For the purpose, we will be using this table of rumps the same as before. Let us start, for example, 
with the point of the table have, having a latitude of 50 degrees and a longitude of 57 degrees and 55 minutes. Trace a vertical line from the equator representing the meridian of this point here. This is the meridian of 50, uh, 57 degrees and 55 minutes. And find its intersection with the rumb line here. And now comes the magic part. The red horizontal line containing the, port, the point of intersection will represent the parallel of latitude 50 degrees north in our projection. Repeat the procedure with all other points of the table until all parallels have been found. The work is done. Very simple, is it not? But how can we be sure that all rump lines, and not only the one used to construct the projection, are represented correctly? We can prove it mathematically today, but not at Mercator's time. The only way available to him would be to experiment with all the seven rums of the table and confirm that they were indeed depicted as expected, which he certainly did. Now, what most people usually don't know is that Mercator's invention passed almost unnoticed by pilots and cartographers and was only adopted by marine navigation near the end of the 18th century, not because they were stubborn or ignorant, but owing to its incompatibility with the navigational methods of the time still based on the latitudes and magnetic courses, not on latitudes, longitudes, and through geographical directions as the Mercata projection. Only after the longitude problem was solved and the distribution of magnetic declination throughout the world was known, could the old cartographic model originated in the continuum planisphere, planisphere be abandoned for good and replaced by the Mercator projection? But the story is not over. When we look at the geographical content of Mercator's world map, which we did recently, we realized that places are not really represented according to their latitudes and longitudes as they should. If we compare, for example, the depiction of Africa on the right in the Mercators with the one of a modern map on the left, we realize, we realize with amazement that the same old east-west displacement is still present. How should we interpret this unexpected flaw the fact is that Mercator could do no better than transferring directly the information of the maps and charts of his time to the novel projection with no concern for their distortion, assuming that both the latitudes and longitudes of the places were correct. Could he have made a better job? Not really. First, because he shared with his contemporaries a wrong interpretation about the geometry of the charts, which only in the present day was fully understood by our analysis. And second, because a new survey of the world would be required, this time based on the latitudes, longitudes, and through directions in order to construct an accurate Mercator's chart. As we know, such endeavor could only be started after the longitude problem was solved, well into the 18th century. And we are coming to the end of our talk, and I now give the, word, the last word to the Henry for the, the final conclusions. So three minutes more and your suffering is ended. <laughs> okay, so let me sum up briefly what we tried to do here today. We showed, firstly, that the image of the world, the overall shape of the land masses, the lines of coast, the forms of the continents, etc., that this image was created mostly in the 16th century. Many other important developments in cartography took place before and afterwards, of course, in particular from the 17th century until today, the history of map making has been one of great progress. Still, 
the first half of the 16th century truly deserves a privileged place of honor in this long and remarkable story as the period in which maps for the whole earth were first made based on reliable empirical data. Secondly, we also showed that the construction of this image of the world was a direct consequence of the onset of long-distance oceanic voyages, something that Portuguese and Spanish sailors started to do in the 15th century and afterwards English sailors, Dutch sailors, everybody did in the, in the 16th and 17th century. The point is, the Earth was known in its full extension because it started to be traversed, traversed in regular voyages in its full extension. It seems tautological, but it bears being noted. Thirdly, we further showed that construct, constructing the image of the Earth was a rather complex process with detours in many multiple directions, with many technological advances and important new scientific and mathematical ideas. The maritime voyages of the early modern period were not just great adventures. They were also important and well-planned enterprises where many issues of a scientific nature had to be tackled and resolved. Okay, this far, this is no big news. I mean, perhaps some of you were not acquainted with all of the above, but we fully agree that most of this was reasonably known to historians. But we also showed quite more, some of it totally new, and some of it, we ha I have to say, for us, and I hope to you, some really surprising. We showed that the image of the world that was constructed in the 16th century and then conveyed and accepted for several centuries afterwards was intimately connected with the ways in which navigation was conducted, that is, how ships were steered and their position determined at sea. We showed that the great maps that shaped our image of the world at the period, the Cantino map, the Waldseemuller map, many other, all bear the signature of their maritime origin consisting in a particular and unconventional geometry of the land masses. In a very deep, in very deep and radical ways, but ways that we can today detect and measure, all of these maps bear the imprint of artisanal nautical practices. Our image of the world was determined by the practices of pilots, mariners, and other artisans. This is a very recent and very remarkable finding, and as I said, this audience is one of the first to know about it. That the very first cartographic depictions of the whole earth, the maps that were used by kings and emperors, by diplomats, popes and princes, the maps which became the symbols of empire and conquest, that all of these maps bear within them in an indelible manner the marks of the activities of humble sailors and nearly illiterate pilots, this is a fact that not only fills us with awe, but also reminds us of the true ways in which knowledge about the world was constructed. Thank you very much.